Headmaster, it is a great privilege to welcome you all to our campus this morning to today's Flannery O'Connor of 50-Year Retrospective. This is Cistercian's first ever interscholastic colloquium. As a school community, we are sincerely blessed to have so many of you come out and be a part from across all the Metroplex, but also coming up from Waco as well. All the students present today have submitted in advance such thoughtful, original, and carefully crafted papers and reflections that is certain to make today's colloquium a success. Further, we are proud, very proud to have one of our own, Father Gregory Schwierz, our senior English professor, to speak today about Henry O'Connor's art and the difficult task of literary criticism. Dr. Ralph Wood, it is a sincere pleasure to have you here with us today, coming all this way to share the fruit of your extensive research and study, and also your distinguished writing on Flannery O'Connor. And thank you as well for bringing your lovely wife, Suzanne. As with so many of our great events here at Cistercia, let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty Father, with you, there is no darkness. From you, nothing is hidden. As we gather today to share our reflections and insights regarding such an influential and essentially Christian artist as Flannery O'Connor, we first thank you for making this day possible. Thank you for bringing so many outstanding students and faculty sponsors to our campus. We ask that you help us to make sure they feel welcome. Help those who participate, not only to gain insight into O'Connor's work, but in doing so to also gain insight into all that makes us truly and most fully human, all that puts us into a deeper and more mature relationship with you. Free each of today's presenters from any and all undue anxiety, giving them the liberty and trust to speak before others with confidence and a peaceful spirit. Grant us who listen to them a spirit of openness and generosity as we attend closely to each other's attempt to wrestle with the deep issues of race, culture, and religion that Flannery O'Connor presents for our consideration. Finally, Father, when today's conference draws to a close, we do ask that you please grant everyone, especially those traveling back to Waco, a safe return home. To you be all the glory, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son. At this time, I would like to recognize and bring to the microphone one whose singular vision, enthusiasm, and sustained hard work over the course of many, many months has made today's colloquium possible. He has done such a marvelous job of providing authentic collaborative leadership with colleagues both here at Cistercia and with schools throughout North Texas. Without further ado, a veteran English teacher himself of almost 20 years and the chairman of our English department, Mr. Gary Nye. Good morning, everyone. I don't want to be up here long. We've got a very full program today. And so I would like to start with some thank yous. I'd first like to thank uh, our abbot, Father Peter Verhalen, and our headmaster, Father Paul McCormick, for their openness and encouragement in having this conference. This is the first time that we've had an interscholastic academic conference of this type. And so uh, I very much appreciate their willingness to, to try this and uh, to support it. I'd also like to thank the planning committee for this conference, Father Gregory Schwears, Dr. Thomas Pruitt, Mrs. Jackie Greenfield, Mrs. Carol Williamson, and Mrs. Kelly Lipscomb. I'd also like to thank in a special way Mr. Jared Colley of the Oak Ridge School and Mr. Joel Garza of Greenhill and the whole Oak Ridge School faculty and staff for the past two years, they've had an inter interscholastic academic conference similar to our own, and it was because of their conference, which our students attended the last two years, that I felt 
brave enough to attempt something like this. And our students had a wonderful experience there. It was excellent, and it really inspired us to try to do something similar. So thank you very much. This conference is all about collaboration between students and teachers and peer institutions, and it's about scholarship. And this, the essays that have come in are excellent essays. Uh, I've read almost 100 of them, and 48 presenters today have all done a fine job. And I think we'll all gain a lot of insight into Flannery's work today. I would like to talk about just some basic logistics here. So all of the conferences will happen, all the sessions will happen on this side of the campus, in our upper school buildings. So the upper school buildings are directly here, and on the upper level you have forms five, Roman numeral five, and seven. We're skipping six to create some space. And so you'll see on your schedule where your session is. Down below, downstairs, directly below those classrooms, is Form 8, 8A and 8B. Some students are presenting in the theater. The theater adjoins the courtyard on this side, and you'll enter that building directly over here, and you'll be directed to the theater. The theater has more seating, obviously, than the classrooms. The classrooms seat about 20 to 22, and so the others will go into the theater. Most will go into the theater. I would ask our Cistercian students to hang back a little bit and let our guests fill in the classrooms so that all of the students from a particular school will have the opportunity to see their own classmates present if they wish. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the opening presentation. Father Gregory Schwierz was born in 1953 and is a priest and monk of Our Lady of Dallas, Cistercian Abbey, and a member of the English Department of the Cistercian Preparatory School for 37 years. Born and raised in South Texas, Father Gregory is a graduate of the University of Dallas, where he received a BA in philosophy, summa cum laude in 1977, and his MA in theology in 1981. After study in Rome at the Pontifical University of St. Anselms, he did graduate work at the University of Texas in Arlington, where he received an MA in English in 1983. During this past academic year, Father Gregory took a sabbatical, studying art history in London, England. Among his many academic interests, Father Gregory has presented papers, and published reviews and articles on topics ranging from Dante Alighieri's Inferno to the works of the English recusant poet Robert Southwell. How do they pronounce that name, good father? <coughs> Southern. The influence of Bernard of Clairvaux on Elizabethan letters, and of course the stories of Flannery O'Connor. His works may be referenced in such publications as the American Benedictine Review, the 16th Century Review, and the American Academy of Religion. In January 2015, his article, Flannery O'Connor and the Problem of Baptism, Sectarian Controversies in the River, will be published in The Way, an international journal of contemporary Christian spirituality edited by the Jesuits in England. Currently, he's working on another article entitled Flannery O'Connor and the Mechanical Universe, the Southern Renaissance and Technological Innovations. Apart from his ministerial and teaching responsibilities, Father Gregory enjoys swimming, Italian opera, the films of Alfred Hitchcock and Stanley Kubrick, the novels of Umberto Eco, and has, where is it, Eco, and has most recently become a diehard fan of Chelsea Premier League football in the UK. <laughs> so welcome to you all, and I welcome to the podium. Father Gregory Schwierz. Get that glass of milk. Good morning, everybody. I, I hope you're doing well. 
if you're not, we have plenty of caffeine out there. I hope you will help yourself to uh, many, many milligrams of it to keep you uh, open and uh, awake. Uh, Gary Knight has been the best of leaders in this process. Uh, almost two years ago, uh, we were in a departmental meeting and he related his experiences at our sister school and what they had done. And we went around the table asking for ideas. And for those of you who have been my students, uh, realizing that I've never been accused of not speaking, uh, I chirped up, chimed up, shouted out, well, you know, in 2014, it's going to be the 50th anniversary of Flannery, or Saint Flannery as I call her, <laughs> death, and we should do something about that. Well, God punishes all good ideas. And Gary turned to me and said, okay, why don't you write a program? Which then led to, why don't you propose and write up the questions? So if you didn't like the questions, if you found them too difficult or too easy, do not blame Gary, blame me. That's why I'm going to go hide after my address. <laughs> Not really. But it has been, it's been a fun two years. Uh, apart from the fact that I was in London studying art history, uh, Gary is a firm believer in international telephone call and email. And we exchanged many, many uh, conversations trying to get ready for today. And so in a very, in a very special way, I do want to welcome all of you here because uh, you have engaged in something which is uh, very dear to my heart, uh, and that is the discovery of one of America's great writers, not a female writer, but a Catholic writer, but a Southern writer, just one of America's great writers, and that's Mary Flannery O'Connor. As many of you here know, and as my introduction alluded to, I have, since I was a university student, uh, been in love with Dante's Divine Comedy, and there is a passage in the Inferno, almost at the beginning, in Canto 9, in which Dante is blocked with his guide Virgil and stands in front of the walls of lower hell of Dis. And the poet, at that critical point, writes this terza. O voi che avete intellecti sane, Mirate la dottrina che si esconde sotto il velame degli versi strani. O oh, you that have such strong intellects, see the teaching that is hidden underneath the veil of these strange lines. It seems to me that each of you here have been engaged in a very difficult task, many of you for weeks, if not months, reading and analyzing and writing about Flannery O'Connor. And in so doing, you have done exactly what Dante has asked you to do, to look beyond the surface meaning, beyond the literal narrative, and enter into what we might call the Dantesque secret recesses of O'Connor's imagination, that very frightening dark place that causes us to laugh uh, and to quake in our boots, and to emerge finally on the other side, as Dante does at the end of the Inferno, into the bright light and into the fresh air of a deeper understanding of her life her work, and most importantly, her imagination. That is an impressive task that you have engaged in, and I hope will continue to engage in. And I commend each of you who have begun that journey, or more properly, what I would like to call it, that pilgrimage. Which brings me to the title of this short dress, of which I already had a couple of people come to me and say, how did that happen? The formal title is Hoi Malloy, 
pilgrims and peacocks, O'Connor and criticism. It is a weird title, I admit, but one which hopefully by the end of the day will resonate in your minds with as much understanding as you have already shown to us in reading and writing about St. Flannery, as I jestingly like to call her. What each of you have done in your own particular way is that you have entered into the realm of what it means to be a critic. A critic in the profoundest sense of the word. Uh, the word critic, of course, as you know, uh, it is a Greek word, krites. Uh, and the etymology of that word means the process of making a judgment or making uh, a, a discerning action, the criticos, krino, I judge. And that is really what you have been doing in the reading of these stories, because you've attempted to grab hold of them and to get beneath the surface and to see what is really there, what is the really real. You have, in a certain sense, been vicariously reenacting uh, that great moment in Plato's writings in which he discusses what has been called Plato's cave. And you have, it, in some real sense, you have escaped. You have escaped out into the light. You are no longer a person who relies merely on the opinions of others. Because that's what the hoi the many do. They spout off opinions without that kind of reflective thoughtfulness, that, ans that asking of questions, the receiving of answers, and the asking of yet another set of questions. You have aligned yourself with those who undertake the difficult task of submitting your intellect and imagination to the art and discipline of what it means to be a literary critic. Someone who makes real judgments about the words and the text which you have read. By the application then of the principles of right reason and logic, to an imaginative text, to an artistic text made by Flannery. You have an understanding of what Dante calls la doctrina, the teaching, which any significant work of fiction yields up to those of us who take on the task of being or becoming the skillful artisans of this craft, of the techne, of what we call literary criticism. In a certain sense, you have become, each of you, have become the, the new Aeneas, as it were, carrying on your backs the heavy load, not of your father uh, and Kaisis necessarily, but the infinitely more ponderous weight of what is best in our culture in order that others who come with you and after you may know exactly what we have seen, what we together have known and understood, and what we have come to value through our individual and our collective judgments, and finally to understand what is worth preserving for the generations who come after us. There is a, a wonderful painting, very large. It, hand, it, it hangs in the Villa Borghese in Rome, done by Federico Barocci, and is entitled simply Aeneas Fleeing from Troy. The first time that I saw it, I was a student of theology uh, in Rome many years ago with our abbot. Uh, he was doing something in classical Latin at the Vatican, and I said, I'm not interested in that. I'm going to the Villa Borghese, a beautiful place to have a coffee in an afternoon of divertimento. And as I was going to the museum, there was this magnificent painting by Marocci. And it shows Aeneas with the edifice of Troy collapsing about him. The world that he knew was in complete destructive mode. 
and yet his father Anchises is wrapped around him, and on the left is his beloved wife, wife Reusa, and on the other side uh, is his son, his very young son, Ascanius. And in looking and in thinking about that picture, it reminded me very much of what I hope you are beginning to do. You are, in a certain sense, in the best sense of the word, you are the privileged. Because you have the opportunity in this conference and in your work back at your individual schools to take upon yourselves the very burdensome task of the past, of what is best in the past, and to see that it is carried forward, not for your own egotistical self-exaltation, but for three reasons. The first is that you have come by thoughtful judgment to recognize the value of the past of Anchises on your back. You have come to understand that those that you love most, wife, spouse, they also need to share in that. And that little child, that one who is yet to understand, you are going to be the one by engaging in the difficult task of carrying forward the past, you will give to him or her the cultural fruits of your own labors. And that is really what we are about here today. We're going to have fun, we're going to enjoy it. I'm looking forward to the breakout sessions, but ultimately we are engaged in what I think is a very serious moment. But let me conclude. Sounds like a sermon, and I hate sermons. <laughs> Outside, you will find postcards for your enjoyment. And if you wish to be relieved of shekels, dollars, British pounds, of course, you can buy them. But I was struck by a selection that I did not make, but our wonderful librarian, Jeff Nadasco made. One of them is this one here. I, I know you can't see what's on it, but I hope you do take a look at it. It's a split shot of two things. The lower one is the house of Andalusia, or as they say in Milledgeville, Georgia, Andalusia. And it shows the very large screened-in porch. And as we know from her letters, this was the place that five or six days a week, she gathered, usually in the morning, for three hours, sitting at her Underwood manual typewriter, producing for us the things that we have read and come to love and hopefully come to a better understanding of. And it seemed to me that the image of a young woman who has been broken, completely broken, by a disease that she knows will kill her long before her time, she died at 39 in August of 1964. And yet, each day she went out onto that porch and sat at that Underwood typewriter, and she produced those wonderful things, those wonderful artifacts to the man his heart mind. Good country people. The revelation. Those wonderful novels. And so many other essays. And it simply struck me that if we needed a, a secular saint for what we are doing today, what better one could we possibly choose than St. Flannery? Because through all the difficulties of her life, her dedication not only to art, but to the critical process of cutting through all of the nonsense of her age and presenting it and leaving it for us as a kind of shining realm. The second image, and here I'll close, is of a peacock, that beautiful fan of feathers. As I think many of you know who have read O'Connor, one of her key insights that orchestrate her writing is what she calls the moment of grace. That critical point, typically at the very end of the life of the protagonist or the anti-hero or heroine, in which they come to 
to the insight that transcends their daily lives. They end up for a fraction of a second, seeing in vision-like fashion, in dream-like fashion, a world that is different, transformed from the one that they are in. The grandmother, in A Good Man is Hard to Find, as she reaches out to touch him, why, you're one of my babies. And then she shuffled him, with a smile on her face. Or Holga, having had her glasses stolen, looks out of that window and she sees a figure <laughs> that looks as though it's walking on the waters. Or my favorite, that warthog from hell, Ruby Turpin, who hears not the crickets sounding, which everyone else does, but she hears the glorious sounds of hallelujah as she sees all of those who are truly her betters that she, that she treated as her inferiors. And she recognizes that she indeed may cross that fiery ridge into the heavenly kingdom, but she will be last. But that's good enough. The last one through the pearly gate just gets as much as anybody else. And so my hope for all of us one day is that we will see each other, not at the pearly gate, but at our appropriately assigned place and it will be around a small desk with a rather unattractive woman banging away at her underwood typewriter with a stack of stories this high. And she looks up and she sees us and she says, well, help yourself. You're way behind in the reading. And we will all smile because we know that there are still things of beauty and insight and moments of grace for us to learn, even in the world that transcends this one. Thank you. Thank you, Father Greg. At this time, uh, if you would proceed to the first session, uh, for block one, and to your classroom. Like, are all of you